Thanks, Ben, for that introduction. Um, as you said, uh, my name's Kimberly, and I'm a second year student at HBS. Um, I was an army engineer for five years. I was uh, stationed in Germany, and then deployed to Afghanistan in 2010 as a route clearance platoon leader, and I was in the Wardak in the Ghazni provinces, which um, coincidentally, Keith was as well. Um, so anyway, uh, I also worked with the provincial reconstruction teams and with the uh, cultural support team with the female engagement teams while I was there, and one of the things I took away was that we really need to engage with the Afghan population in ways that are beyond the scope of what we traditionally do in the military um, for a sustainable future. So Keith and I decided to start this company a couple months ago in February. We are importing saffron from Afghanistan directly from the farmers, and we're connecting them to the international marketplace. So I'll turn it over to Keith to give you a brief background um, about the how and the why. Oh, okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Kim. Um, can everybody hear me? I'm not sure if the audio is working. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm uh, actually just returned from Afghanistan a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, this idea started with just a couple. I got it right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this idea started with uh, just a conversation between me and Kim. I've been working in Afghanistan over the past four years with the uh, Afghanistan Hands Program. Some of you may be familiar with it. But uh, most recently working with the Special Operations Task Force in uh, eastern Afghanistan, province of uh, Wardak. Previously I had been in Kabul and then in uh, Badakhshan. So, uh, you know, I, I feel personally invested in the future of Afghanistan. As I'm sure many of you guys who have served overseas in either Iraq or Afghanistan do as well. I mean, um, our nation has spent so much and we've, we've personally sacrificed so much to be there. It's important to me to see that the country is successful. So one of the... Uh, the gaps that I saw uh, working in Afghanistan is that we, we've, we've been putting a lot of effort into developing, um, you know, the urban centers, a lot of money in Kabul, Herat, Mazar Sharif, and we've kind of missed the, the uh, rural majority of the population. And uh, we've also kind of missed the, the agricultural uh, sector, which is the largest, uh, you know, sector in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a lot of money spent developing agricultural capacity, which is there, but it's not expanding at the rate that we would expect. And, and, and the reason is because there's no market for Afghan goods um, outside of Afghanistan. So um, I think this clicker will take me to the next slide. So just, you know, some, some big picture stuff. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, Thomas Barnett. If not, he's got some great YouTube videos um, with some lectures. But uh, he has this idea of uh, the non-integrated gap countries. So these are countries that are not integrated into, uh, you know, the uh, international marketplace. And, uh, you know, just briefly, this map shows which ones are the non-integrated gap countries. And if you overlay that map with where we've been involved in conflict since the end of Col the Cold War, it, it falls right into this uh, map of these countries that are not economically, economically connected. So, uh, you know, that's kind of where this thinking comes from. And, and Afghanistan is, uh, when you think of it on a small scale, it's, it's a microcosm for this, you know, larger problem. When you have the rural populations that's... Uh, not connected to the rest of the country and not connected internationally. That's the most vulnerable part of the population. That's where the Taliban recruits from, and that's that's where you're going to see instability in the future. So, you know, we're not here to solve the world's problems. We just want to, you know, start with a simple idea. So, one of my favorite proverbs, "Katra uh, bakatra daria mesha," means uh, the river is made drop by drop. So, we want to just how do how do we address this problem from from a small uh, startup point of view? Well, in Afghanistan, you know, I worked primarily as a government liaison, a government advisor, and uh, worked in, you know, the, the lines of effort of, of government and development. And, you know, what I see, there's a lot of great people doing a lot of great things in development, but a lot of it's donor-driven. And unfortunately, you know, I, I've been working with organizations that just, they disappear when the funds are gone. You know, when the donor nation stops funding, um, you know, that, that effort, you know, as good as it may have been, is uh, not sustainable. So one of the key tenets in, in how we're going to address this is, is it has to be market driven, it has to be profitable uh, for the farmers and for the people who get involved. Uh, I mean, the efficiency of um, for-profit businesses, uh, you know, and, and how they spend money is, you know, much greater than any government can do, especially a foreign government um, trying to, like, throw money at the problem. So, uh, you know, there's a stat that you guys may have heard that um, we've spent more in Afghanistan you know, we've spent more money in Afghanistan, inflation adjusted, than we did um, after World War II in, in Western Europe. You know, and, that, and while that sounds bad, you know, like really, it's the efficiency of the money we spent is is very small. So, uh, so our idea is it has to be market-driven uh, development. The other piece is it has to be um, you know connected down to the local level. 
We don't want to be just forward purchasers of a product and selling it on the world market. We want to partner with the, the Afghans who are producing these. We want to make sure that they see a benefit from the profit that their products uh, produce. So, uh, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but, but our goal is to connect directly with the farmers and view them not just as suppliers, but as partners in our business model. So, why saffron? There's a lot of uh, benefits to starting with saffron. Um, you know, my work in, in Wardak province, I met a farmer, uh, Haji Yosef, very business savvy, you know, very eager guy. He's, you know, like the six-year-old uh, Afghan farmer who rides a motorcycle around Kabul. Um, you know, and, and he was trying to sell his, his saffron. And he was producing a lot of saffron, but not increasing his production because all he was selling was in Afghanistan and, and a few, few buyers in the marketplace. Uh, so, you know, this got me thinking about saffron as a viable product. Uh, some of the advantages of saffron, uh, first of all, just as the product itself, is a very high price to weight ratio. So we minimize a lot of the problems that would occur if we were trying to ship apples or, or apricots or something like that, where we have to ship in large bulks over land. Uh, we can just fly this stuff out of Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, it has the added benefit of being a replacement crop for, uh, for opium. So, um, well, you know, opium is, you know, a strategic commodity for the, for the Taliban. You know, the, the farmers, even though opium is profitable, they, they grow it because opium is profitable for them and they can make a living. But there's a lot of risk to that. You know, anytime, like, the DEA or someone could come and burn their field down, you know, that's not a good business model. Uh, but if we can give them a better opportunity with saffron, you know, that's going to uh, displace some of this opium production that we see. And right now, opium production is higher now than it ever has been in Afghanistan. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is that Afghanistan, with its, its high elevation and its uh, climate, is actually ideal for growing uh, this particular crop. And it has a lot of advantages. In fact, that the cost of labor is so low, this is a very laborious uh, crop to, to refine and, and produce. So a little bit about our business model. Um, you know, saffron in, in the provinces, we, we work in two provinces right now, um, in Herat and Wardak. Saffron is relatively new in Wardak. In Herat, it's been, uh, been around for a while. Um, it's kind of the, the crop du jour uh, there in, in Herat. So we first identify these producers, and we want to make sure we're actually buying from, from farmers and not just, you know, basically a bazaar or people who collect saffron. So we want to... Uh, uh, you know, identify those farmers. We want to identify those farmers with the capability to reinvest in their own farms and to expand their own production. So our first process is, is a vetting process with the farmers. We identify our key partners, um, and then this is who we're purchasing the, the saffron from. Uh, you know, we have, we're trying to move as much of the value chain as we can to Afghanistan. Uh, we have people in Kabul um, who receive the saffron from Herat and Wardak. They, uh, they process the saffron and package it for uh, shipment to the U.S. Uh, and when we get it in the U.S., we, uh, we test the saffron. And this is where we can prove to our, uh, to our customers that saffron is indeed higher quality than the saffron that's on the market now. Um, most of the saffron on the market now comes from Spain and, uh, you know, some illicit stuff from Iran. But it's, it doesn't match the quality of uh, the Afghanistan saffron. So uh, we test all the saffron from, you know, we test a portion of the saffron from each farmer um, in the U.S. We'd like to eventually move that testing to Afghanistan. That's kind of our next steps for the supply chain. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we're selling it uh, B2B and uh, B2C sales. Um, and, you know, the key part of our business model is that we're reinvesting the profits, 50% uh, of the profits back into the farmers. So um, we give 25% of that as, as just a cash, uh, you know, reinvestment. And how they, and they can use it how they see fit. And the other 25% we're putting in real capital, like, um, you know, equipment, machinery, um, drying equipment, um, you know, things, things like that. So, uh, you know, with this model, we hope to increase the yields year by year. And uh, the key to that is creating a market for it internationally. So with that, I will turn it over to Kim. So I'll start to talk about it a little bit on the market side. Keith had mentioned, um, you know, kind of the competitive landscape in the U.S. So I would say actually like 90% of the U.S. market is made up of Iranian saffron that goes through Spain, gets repackaged as Spanish saffron and then comes to the U.S. market. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so in the last five years, we've had a 13% CAGR um, with rising imports of saffron into the U.S., which is very encouraging. Um, it's a small market. It's $160 million. It's not that great, but it's a very fragmented market, and we think that we would be able to grab some market share. Um, the U.S. consumer doesn't really know very much about saffron. So I don't, I don't expect you guys to know too much about it either, but it's used in Spanish paella, it's used in 
uh, risotto Milanese, and it can be used for many. It can be used in tea as well because it's very, very high in antioxidants, um, very many, many health benefits. And actually, Alexander the Great used to bathe in saffron after his battles um, to heal his wounds. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Most people don't know this stuff about saffron. So while there is a pretty awesome opportunity to grow the market, it's also a huge marketing cost as well, which as a small startup is not something that we can undertake you know, immediately with our limited funds. Um, I also want to do a quick you know, parallel with Madagascar vanilla and with coffee, because those are both, um, they used to be commodity products. Um, and as people got to know about, like, oh, Madagascar vanilla is really the highest quality vanilla, and, and now chefs and even you know, cooks at home really look for Madagascar vanilla. And they're willing to buy, they have a higher willingness to pay for vanilla because it, you know, it has that quality, like brand equity stamped on it. And I want the same thing to happen to Afghan saffron because it is actually the highest quality. Keith had mentioned we've been doing testing. It's according to the ISO standards. And 190 is the minimal level of crocines um, that you need to make ISO standards. And our saffron tested at the end of the season at 237, which is amazing. So we definitely have the higher quality. It's just a matter of getting the, the word out. So. Here's our market penetration plan, basically like our go-to market plan. Um, this past summer, we spent most of our time doing B2B sales. So we went to the fancy food fair in New York City back in June. We met a lot of um, people who were interested in our idea and our story who would be both either, I guess you could say like compliments or um, potential buyers, just people who really could help us out. Um, it was really important for us to get um, sponsorship from like key opinion leaders, like chefs in the community, people who have been dealing in high-end spices for a long time. Um, so giving them samples and having them hear about our story was very important. Going to restaurants is a completely different ballgame, which I tried doing in the beginning, and is a lot harder than people think it is. Um, we also are selling to three brick-and-mortar stores in Boston, to Wilson Farms, Allendale Farms, and Savonor's Market, and it's the more like health-conscious consumer with the higher willingness to pay, you know, organic, you know, they're all gluten-free. Um, so that kind of, that kind of uh, customer. And then lastly, you know, this past month, we've been working on a, a comprehensive um, online digital marketing strategy to go online. So we have our website up. We're going to start to do sales online. And um, it's, you know, most of the people that we're trying to reach have probably never heard about Saffron. So they're willing to pay, like, maybe five bucks or so, maybe ten bucks, to try saffron for the first time, and they're going to need recipes. You know, they're going to need more information on how to use saffron. Um, and if it doesn't stick with them, they're probably not going to buy it again. So that's one target customer for the online segment. Another one would be people who would buy it as a gift, so like a high end. So one of my one of my brick and mortar stores, Savonors, somebody bought two bottles of our tiny little saffron um, for twenty nine ninety nine each. So that's like sixty bucks worth of saffron. But he obviously bought it as a gift for somebody else. And I think that's going to be a key um, target customer segment that's going to be very profitable for us. So I did some really quick financial projections. And as you guys know, you know, you have to make some assumptions. So I actually try to make some very conservative assumptions. So we have a gross margin of 42%. Um, and right now, we're kind of doing 70%, actually, because there was a lot more cost that like I had to run into, for tr like transportation, for example, or DHL in Afghanistan. You guys can ask about that later if you're interested. sg and and Tepper's on a sales and a sale price of $3,000 per kilo. Um, all in all, you know, let's say we take 1% of the market, $300,000 in profit, and then 5% of the market, $1.3 million. Um, still very small, but, you know, I think it's really hard to figure out if we actually grow the market, you know, get more consumers interested. It could be a lot greater. So I kind of mentioned our current activities right now. We're really focused on more iterations of our packaging and seeing what kind of channels and testing these assumptions. So we've talked a lot about entrepreneurship here and what it's like to be in a startup. So you know that saying, fail hard, fail fast. We have many different iterations of packaging that, that speak to different types of segments. So that's what we're testing now. And earlier this summer, I visited Afghanistan for a couple of weeks um, with my entrepreneurship professor at HBS and um, establish our supply chain in Afghanistan with Keith's help, um, which was interesting. You know, being like a woman in Afghanistan as a civilian this time, 
and in speaking with like a bunch of Pashto farmers in Herat and having a translator, and I know a lot of things were lost in translation, but it, I mean, that's one of the barriers, right? But it's got to happen, and, and I learned a lot from the experience, and one of the things I really learned was we really have to like have our Afghan partners be the most important people in this value chain. Just here are some, idea, some uh, examples of some of the marketing stuff we do, some of the information packets and postcards that we give to our prospective buyers. I made that really crappy logo on the top um, and <laughs> finally decided to pony up the money to do a 99 designs, which is, I highly recommend this. It's like you pay 300 bucks, so $299, and it's like a, kind of like a platform where they bring other designers on, and it's, a, it's, based, it's like kind of an auction and a... Um, Anyway, check it out if you guys want to make a logo. Instead of spending like you know hundreds of hundreds of dollars on it, you know you get a really great logo and it's it's pretty fast. We got it within two weeks. So as, as we've mentioned before, like having our Afghan partners is the most important thing, and having a lot of the value adds, such as like you know weighing out the saffron packaging in Afghanistan, maybe doing some of the PR and the marketing um, in Afghanistan, and really connecting people to the stories. That's been our most important thing. Shakur is our buyer in Herat. Um, he's actually an agricultural expert and has been working with the farmers for like 10 years. Seema Garyani, um, she's, she's smart. She's a great businesswoman because she knows uh, what the international marketplace is looking for because she's a woman saffron company owner and she employs all women. So when I met her, she had everything straight. Like she's gotten a lot of help from outside sources and she's, you know, she's doing really well. Haji Yosef is our farmer in Wardak. Um, he's great as well, and I think Wardak is one of the provinces that we really want to focus on, and we also have a connection um, with another guy whose father was a tribal leader in Wardak, and, and he's, he's actually in the U.S. and graduated from MBA school here, here and understands um, our plans in the future for doing like, more vertical integration because of you know, transparency and trust and standardization. And, yeah, that's it. So. Yeah, we'd love to open it up for questions or comments or if you guys have any suggestions or advice, we'd be glad to hear them. So, yeah. Way in the back. Or wherever the mic is. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So, yes and no. So I have some contacts who have connections in Whole Foods, and the reason why I'm hesitant to go to them just yet is because, just like any startup, I want to at least like get some, get some customers and, and get our operations kind of figured out before we just go directly to Whole Foods. Um, Whole Foods has kind of a possible reputation of, um, I don't know how to, squeezing margins. Squeezing margins. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you come at the table, it's just like any negotiation, right? You want to have some good background behind you. You want to have some good solid ground to stand on. So our way of doing that is to do local stores. And actually, most of those local stores, like they, it's kind of a rivalry between them and Whole Foods because they save, they they basically serve the same type of customer. So what I want to do first is serve this market where I can have more personal relationships and have more control over my supply chain and distribution and branding. Then go to Whole Foods first, and then yes, they'd help me out, and I think we'd scale up really fast. But I would lose control over some of the negotiation um, issues that would be important to me, such as also like you know how my relationship with the farmers, or how much volume I have to do, because instantly I'd be have to provide volume, and I don't know if we can do that quite yet, because we need to do the We need to also match it with what's going on with building relationships on the Afghan side and supply. But that's a great question, and definitely it's something we want to do in the future. Hey, so okay. Uh, so on that same vein, what does the competition look like? If you don't have any now, what's that look like projected? Because are you worried about people coming in who are looking at those margins and aren't necessarily concerned with reinvesting into the farmers? Absolutely. Um, I, so let me just talk a little bit about the current market. So there's most of the saffron in the United States is low-end saffron. And the biggest customer is like the ethnic customer, like Indians always use saffron. And so you find them a lot in Indian grocers. Um, they obviously don't reinvest in farmers. It's actually low quality, cheaper saffron, but it's bought in bulk. Um, so the way that I see this 
you know, as us coming into the market, um, we're targeting a different segment and we're opening up a new segment. Um, so I think people would be, so we're focused on the high end, high willingness to pay and high quality. And now where are the places where I think is the only places you can really grow high quality saffron is like Afghanistan, Iran, Morocco, and there's like La Mancha in Spain can grow high quality saffron. I think at this point, you would probably have a limited supply. Um, and so I think kind of like the, the same thing, it, it's a branding issue too, right? So I would want people to buy Afghan saffron also because it's Afghan saffron. Um, so this one is, I guess, a little bit harder to predict. But I, for example, like cashmere saffron, which is traditionally the highest in the world, it's in demand, but they've lowered production by a lot. So in some ways, I would almost say that demand would outstrip supply because there's saffron, it's a, it's a long growing period. It has to be hand harvested. It's not something that can be, there's a high barrier to entry. So in that way, I think with both a great growing climate in Afghanistan and the brand that we can build around the story, we would have a more enviable market position that's harder to, you know, to derail than other sorts of commodities. I don't think it's going to be commoditized, basically. Hi. Um, how concerned are you with the... Right here. Yep. There. Okay. Hi. Uh, how concerned are you with the changing security situation, you know, with the withdrawal of coalition forces and stuff like that affecting your supply chain? Uh, I'm actually very optimistic um, on Afghanistan. I think I probably wouldn't have, you know, gone back for two tours and done the Afghan hands if I wasn't. But um, with the with the new president Ashraf Ghani and the and the solution that they've come to with the the election uh, impasse, I mean that's a very Afghan way to to like solve a problem that's uh, you know I, I like the phrase Afghan solutions to Afghan problems. But uh, you know Ashraf Ghani, if you're not familiar, is very like uh, he's like a leading like world economist, very smart guy. Um, and his priorities are uh, uh, economic development, you know, and, and economic development brings with it security, and that's that's part of our, our theme. Um, I think that the key to to um, mitigating the risk with uh, the the, the pull, you know, the key of mitigating risk with the uh, drawdown of security forces of uh, foreign security forces is to have good relationship with the farmers and really understand what's going on at the at the bottom level. And then other things like you know, we're not just working in Herat, we're not just working, you know. We want to work in several different provinces because sometimes there may be localized problems that could cause an issue with our supply in Herat, you know, Wardak. Um, so, uh, yeah, generally speaking, I'm, I'm optimistic, and, and the key is, you know, we, we know the farmers. You know, we can call the farmers if we want to. Um, you know, we, we're, in, we're in contact with the people on the ground in Afghanistan. Thanks. I, I love what you're doing, and I have a couple quick comments before I've got a question that I hope is useful. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm, I'm really impressed you're a pair of MBA students who are, you've got a business plan that doesn't involve an iPhone, and I <laughs> wish I saw more of that. Um, <laughs> I, I was an MBA student once. Um, and then secondly, if I, this is the other brilliant part, is that if I could find an agricultural product that I could sell for $8,000 a kilo. I'd have probably have the DEA following me around, which, you know, is <laughs> it's good that you don't. Yeah. You're doing something else with them. Um, but the last, okay, but the last time I bought saffron, and I did just a couple months ago because I was making paella, and you need saffron. So you go to the grocery store and you look at the holy heck, you know, the price on it. Um, it is something that I reach for when I make paella. And then you said, oh, but I can also make risotto milanese, and I have never done that. I got to do that too. Here's my question: um, Do you do you need to cultivate in order to to to, to uh, develop the business? Do you need to cultivate a taste amongst Americans for Afghan cuisine? That's a great idea. Be because I think that maybe just because we have now this huge cohort of folks in the United States who understand Afghan culture. I've probably eaten, I've never been there. I mean, I was, I was a Navy guy back in the day. But uh, we have a big cohort of veterans, right, who have been there, who have eaten there, that sort of thing. Is this something that will help you sell saffron? So uh, that's one way, right, like Afghan cuisine. And I think there was a New York Times article that came out a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, about how Middle East, I know Afghanistan is not quite the Middle East, but Middle Eastern cuisine um, is becoming a big thing, especially in New York City. Um, and so I think actually it's not from like Afghan immigrants coming to the States and um, opening Afghan restaurants, which I think would be a great idea. 
I think it's actually going to come from chefs. And let's say we get like Anthony Bourdain, you know, what's the show again? It's like um, something about, you know, anyway, you guys know him. He's a great chef. He goes to like, uh, he the world yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like no reservations. No reservations. Yeah. And he goes to, you know, the corners of the world and he gets these amazing ingredients and he shows, you know, his whole audience how to cook with it. If we can get someone like that and get people excited, get chefs excited, I, I feel like the chef community, if we get them on board, and they're actually a very fragmented community as well, right? Because they're all very like, it's not like they, they don't follow the crowd, but sometimes they do. And, and it's based on the ingredient. I feel like if you have a great ingredient, and it is a great ingredient, and I've, I've given it to so many chefs, like our specific saffron, and they're like, wow, this is really great saffron. Um, and get them to make recipes and to get their followers to be excited about it, that's the way to do it. So I think Afghan restaurants is one way. But I think the key opinion leader here is the chef community.